Okay, welcome very much. To, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce the first of a series of 12 public lectures in the series Climate Ethics and Climate Economics. This is a series uh, recently funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, so I'm very grateful for their support in funding the series. And it's designed to bring people, economists, philosophers, political theorists, legal scholars, people together from different disciplines to talk about the intersection between economics and ethics. Um, part of the program, and one of the things that makes it distinctive, it was pioneered by some colleagues of ours last year at a workshop in Helsinki, is having a couple of public lectures attached to, to the series. Uh, uh, so, so uh, in addition to uh, the, the smaller workshop. And, it gives me great pleasure today to start the series off with Oxford's own Simon Caney here, uh, whom Dominic will be introducing. Dominic, yes. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, warm welcome from me as well. So um, we're very delighted to have Professor Simon Caney here speaking to us about environmental sustainability, population and intergenerational justice. And so as I came into the building, I thought there are hard questions on this planet, for example, finding the cube in the maze, that is the law faculty, there are harder questions, and then I think the hardest questions, and I think population policy is one of these hardest questions. So I'm very grateful that we have people like Simon actually devoting his time to them. So Simon is professor of, um, of political theory here at the university and fellow at Magdalen College, and he's also the co-director of the Oxford Martin Programme on Human Rights for Future Generations, which co-organizes at workshops. He works on a wide um, range of topics, so global justice, poverty, inequality, um, future generations, and how democratic institutions can be reformed to protect future generations. And today we have the topic of um, population policy and sustainability. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Matthew and Dominic, for the invitation, and to you all for coming here. Uh, the, the topic of um, the paper I'm going to give really is grounded in the following starting point. Um, people here are now... Uh, okay, good, yeah, I can see there. Make claims about using natural resources. Uh, you know, some of us will have used trains or, or cars to get here. We have lighting here. Uh, heating, everything we do involves using natural resources. And it's important to know, well, how much can we permissibly uh, use? How much of the world's natural resources and environmental services can we uh, justifiably use for ourselves? And that's where I want to start. And I think it's actually a very difficult question to answer. And what I want to do is, is talk about um, four different approaches to answering that question in all of which population looms large, because one common reaction is, well, how much we can use depends on how many people there are going to be. So uh, people often say, I've noticed the phrase, uh, an elephant in the room. They always say, well, population is the elephant in the room. Well, in this lecture, it's going to be um, a visible elephant. OK, so now the way uh, I want to begin is just by setting out the nature of the problem as I see it. And then I'm going to um, set out a certain set of criteria. I think any, any answer to the question, how much natural resources can we use, has to comply with. And then I'm going to say that three approaches just fail to answer the question properly. OK, so um, this is the question. Yeah. As I said, we have environmental impacts. Everything we do pretty much has an impact on the natural world. Given that, how much can we use up? Given also that we depend on the natural world. As I put up there, this is not a new question. There's a, a wonderful short story by uh, Leo Tolstoy called How Much Land Does a Man Need? And uh, I'm asking how much natural resources can we permissibly use, which is less catchy, but it has the similar kind of emphasis. Um, any of you who know that short story uh, will know that you need six feet of land to bury a man in uh, because it's a moral about people consuming too much and having too much greed and um, it results in their untimely death. 
So let's try and avoid that. So, you know, as a political philosopher, I always like to un identify the underlying logical structure of the problem we're facing. So I don't know if this is visible. I hope that um, you can read the words within there. But I think the way to address this question about how much natural resources we can use, it's helpful to have this kind of model in mind, where on the right-hand side, as I see it, or as I'm uh, looking at it, there is our impacts on the natural world. And on the left-hand side, there are presuppositions or preconditions that we need to live on this planet. And what we can't do is have impacts that are so great that they undercut the preconditions. So what do I mean by impacts? Well, they will all be familiar ones, but I want to list them because I think the details matter. So we have impacts when we use up um, natural resources, either non-renewable ones, but also renewable ones that we might use too quickly to allow them to renew. We also have environmental impacts, not just by using resources, but by creating environmental bads, whether they are climatic changes or a loss of biodiversity or ozone layer depletion. Um, so Johan Rockström and his team in Stockholm came up with nine planetary boundaries. Uh, these are all what I would call impacts. They're all ways in human beings impact on the natural uh, world. Some of them perhaps are less familiar to us than others. So, um, you know, biodiversity loss, we you know, hear being reported, but these figures here are really quite stark. You know, 25% of species in well-studied taxonomic groups are threatened with extinction. Or, you know, think about um, air quality and air pollution. Again, these are really quite stark and dramatic figures about our impact on the natural world and on other people. So let's then turn to um, the other side of the equation. We're having all these impacts. That wouldn't matter in a sense if we were ethereal creatures who didn't depend on the natural world. And maybe one day we will be when we can sort of be downloaded into computers. But rust proof and so on, computers. But we do depend on the natural world. Uh, I think any account of justice will care about health. Um, if you're a libertarian, you don't want your health being compromised by others. If you're a social democrat, then you think people have interests in having their basic health needs met. And things like um, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, ozone layer depletion, uh, those figures I gave you on air quality and aerosol over overloading, those are all destructive of health, quite catastrophically bad for health. Or think of uh, food. Um, clearly, climate changes with temperature increases, desertification, severe weather events is disruptive of food. So is bi biodiversity loss, which leads to crop uh, failure, aerosol loading, which leads to reduced crop yields, um, biofuels uh, policies um, tend to lead to the use of, of land for um, other sources like energy rather than for, for food. Or think of uh, water, um, you know, climate change will lead to reduced access to water. Uh, there'll be overuse of fresh water. So this puts us in a bind then. This is why I think we have to kind of look at it in this way and we have to ensure that the impacts we're having don't exceed the preconditions that we need. And this is what I mean by the challenge that we have to face then. We have to uh, live sustainably where that means living within our means and not beyond our means. So um, there are lots of definitions of sustainability, uh, thousands of them. I have a very simple one, which is a society is sustainable, sustainable if it can be uh, realized throughout time. What you can't have is a society which does various things, which undercut its ability to persist later on in time. So if it says, well, health and food matter, but they, um, they cultivate the food and they protect the health in ways that actually damage future access to food or future access to health, then that's unsustainable. Um, 
I mean, if you Google sustainability, you find it's applied to almost everything from like concrete to plastic to the natural world to development. Um, but the core idea is just that something can persist through time. So I think a key test is when you have a vision of a just society, is it one that, so to speak, eats itself from within and corrodes the basis of its own perpetuation? That's what living beyond its means would involve. Or is it one where your use, your environmental impacts, for example, are not so great that they undercut the possibility in the future? So that's my stipulation of how I'm defining sustainability. So when we're thinking about this question about how much natural resources we can use and how much uh, environmental services we can benefit from, I think we have to uh, think in terms of what would make a just society sustainable over time. And this, I think, takes us to four kind of questions that we have to address. Uh, three of them are ethical ones, and the fourth one is an empirical one. Now, it's striking that if you read um, accounts of the carrying capacity of the Earth, there's a big literature on how many people can the Earth support. Um, they're very big on the empirics, but hidden away in there are some normative assumptions. Um, so uh, Joel Cohen wrote this very fascinating book on um, how many people can the Earth support. Uh, but it was never really explicit what kind of quality of life people were supposed to enjoy. And so people always looked at, was there going to be enough food? How many people could you feed? Or how many people could you water? But is that really all that we owe to future generations, a world in which they have enough food and water to survive? Um, well, maybe it is, but we need to be explicit about that. So here are, um, I think, three normative uh, issues on which we need to take a stance. And only then will I know how much I can use now, how much you can use now. So I've alluded to one already. One is we have to know how much we owe future generations. And one way to see why this matters is to compare different answers. So one view that occasionally um, some people have held is we owe them nothing. Um, uh, there's this famous uh, passage by uh, actually a former fellow of Magdalen from 200 years ago, where he says, I would fain see what I owe posterity for what has posterity ever done for me. Um, now, actually, he rejects that view, but um, you find others articulating it. So if we owe future generations nothing, then that's terrific, right? We can consume masses and do so with a clean conscience. Most people don't hold that, right? Most people have something like a, a sufficiency threshold, and many are attracted to the Brundtland Commission's view, which I've quoted there, um, which uh, refers to future generations being able to meet their own needs. But that's a, you know, only one other possible view. If you're a utilitarian, you might want to maximize human happiness over time. Uh, if you're an egalitarian, you might want to apply that over time. Now, the key point I want to make here is you can't duck this issue. You have to take a stance on what the principle is. And basically, the more demanding the principle, the less we can have now. The less demanding the principle, the more we can have now. Now, you also need a second thing, because I've said you need to know what principles of justice apply, but we also need to know, you know just shares of what. Now, in the philosophical literature, this goes by the sort of not very gripping title of the metric of justice. And there's sometimes a perception that it doesn't really matter what you should have fair shares of, because they all converge. Um, I don't think that's true. So let's think about various things that you might be entitled to have fair shares of. So one might be GDP or, or wealth. Another one might be happiness. Or you might be a follower of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum and think that it's defined in terms of capabilities. Now, if you look at the empirical determinants of these, often economists argue that they come up with different um, answers. So, for example, uh, uh, Richard Eastland had this famous paper in the 1970s on whether economic growth um, benefited the human species in terms of happiness. And his answer basically was, over time, it doesn't make people any happier. So if you think that justice requires enabling people to be happy, that's going to have a really different answer to someone who says, no, justice is about maximizing GDP over time. Because if he's right, and others like Andrew Oswald uh, at Warwick come to a similar conclusion. If they're right, 
then doing justice to ourselves and future generations is not about bequeathing lots of, of money. So um, different metrics of justice have different impacts on the natural world, and they also have different preconditions. So, for example, some people, just to emphasize the last point, some people think that the good life involves being attached to a particular place, a locale, that you can be close to your, your sort of homeland. Now, if that's true, then rising sea levels um, are disastrous because they forcibly deny you the access to a good that's part of the good life. If, on the other hand, um, you're a preference satisfaction theorist, then you might think, well, yeah, I'd like to be in Kiribati or Tuvalu, but if you pay me a lot more money, I'm quite happy to migrate somewhere else. And so different metrics will have different attitudes towards rising sea levels, which will mean they have different views on whether we should have a, a 1.5 degree target or a 2 degree target or a no, 1.2 degree target. So again, to answer the question, how much can I use now, we need to know not only how much do we owe future generations, but you know, of what? Of happiness, capabilities, uh, money? And of course, and this takes us to the, the thing I'll say most about, we need to know how many people there are going to be. Um, uh, and that means that another answer to the question, um, sorry, another question we need to answer would be, can we permissibly affect the number of people who will be born in the future? Are there reasons of justice that would permit that? Are there reasons of justice that would uh, require that? Um, again, you get a whole range of different views. It seems to be many people's default view is that there's an unlimited right to procreate. I don't suppose people think about it a huge amount, but I think many people's intuitive reactions is there should be no limits. But then there are other people who think, no, um, you could have, and they should have, limits on um, procreation. Now, some of these adopt what you might call a, a macro policy, which is at a societal level, there should be an optimum population size, and we should aim for that. But other people go for a more micro level, as I want to term it, where they think, no, it should apply to each and every one of us. And so you can all um, have a, a quota of one child or 0.5 of a child or two children. So uh, Sarah Connolly, for example, has a, a book out this month um, called One Child, where she thinks you have a right to know more than one child, where you as a couple, right? Uh, Christine Overall, in a book um, in 2012, thinks that uh, you have a responsibility as a person to have no more than one child. So couples can have two. Um, Overall thinks this shouldn't be enforced, but Connolly's view is um, it should be enforced. It can be legally enforced. There's um, uh, another view which is espoused by Kenneth Boulding, an economist writing in the mid-century. And he says, I'll, I'll read you a bit because uh, I have only one positive suggestion to make, a proposal which now seems so far-fetched that it creates only amusement when I propose it. But I think in all seriousness that a system of marketable licenses to have children is the only one which will combine the minimum of social control necessary to the problem, which is reducing population, with the maximum of liberty. So he thinks mothers should have a voucher of for 2.2 children, and then he considers, well, maybe you know, they should divide that um, between men and women. I'm going to talk about this view a bit more later on. That's why I'm describing it more fully. Other people think... No, the just population policy doesn't involve coercive limits of the Connolly, over, sorry, Connolly bolding type. Um, it involves doing things which indirectly might uh, affect population size. So someone like Amartya Sen thinks that if you focus on women's access to education and reproductive autonomy and an adequate standard of living, then it turns out that this will depress population growth. And then other people think you can do things like have financial incentives, either to produce more babies or to uh, have let fewer um, babies. So um, it seems that we just can't um, ignore the population problem. When people say that there's an elephant in the room, I think they do so for a reason. It affects how much we can consume now, partly because it affects the environmental impact. The more people alive, the more emissions but it also affects the preconditions. The more people arrive, the more we're scrabbling for a common set of resources. 
Now, here's the fourth ingredient. So, um, remember, my question is how much in the way of natural resources can we use? Uh, those three are all normative ones I've given about what we owe to future people and so forth. Uh, but we need a really good, solid understanding of the empirical determinants of environmental sustainability. We need to know what causes environmental impacts, for example, and what reduces them. And we need to know uh, what affects environmental preconditions of a just society, whether we can reduce our dependence on the natural world or not. So uh, we need a good understanding of demography and economics, um, amongst other disciplines. So this is the checklist. I think any proposal I put forward to you has to have answers to all of these questions. Now, I labour this because I think three of them don't have answers to these questions. In fact, one of them changes the subject entirely, which you'll see why I say that. So how do we think about these challenges? Well, many people start from the following um, place. Uh, we're living way beyond our means. Um, we have high consumption, we have high emissions of greenhouse gases. These look set to increase. At the same time, we have a startling increase in population size over the last century when it's quadrupled. So the right response here is to focus on element three, you know, just population policy, and to say, well, um, if we're worried about sustainability and having a society that can persist through time, we need to have um, restrictions on population. As I mentioned earlier, Sarah Connolly has this uh, recent book um, saying, do we have a right to more? The answer is no. It's emphatically no. Um, Christine Overall says it's irresponsible to have more than one child per person. And I've mentioned the bolding proposal. So I'm going to give you four reasons why um, I don't think this is the right way to tackle it. Um, one is, um, the reason I went through that four-stage proposal or schema is because I think if, if any suggestion doesn't do that, it's not answering the question. Um, and Connolly and overall uh, and others who push this view uh, that I've come across don't do this. So they don't give us an account of what we owe future generations. Um, I think they assume that you know, we owe them not causing dangerous climate change. But that's not enough. Right? It might be we owe them more than that. And so although Connolly is saying um, a couple can have one child, well, if we owe them more than just surviving climate change, it could turn out we're not entitled to one child. It could be that uh, like amongst 10 people, one of them would have the lucky chance to be a parent. Uh, we don't know because she hasn't really done the sums. So she doesn't give us a normative vision of the just society, and she doesn't give us an empirical account of the determinants of, say, avoiding climate change. So I think it's a bit like going to a restaurant and being given a bill and being told you should pay that, but you, you don't know the size of the bill or what you're paying for, because we don't know what the just society is on this account, um, and um, we don't know the other ingredients that went on the, the menu. So we need to look at the empirics, and when we do so, I think we have other reasons for um, not taking her route. So, uh, you know, as I'm sure many of you know, um, many demographers... <laughs> Many de demographers use this formula that sort of evolved in the early 1970s called the IPAT formula, which says that your environmental impact is a function of the number of people, population, the level of consumption measured by affluence, and the, the level of technology. Now, there has been a big literature since the, the 1970s sort of developing and expanding this and putting in other variables like how many people in a household and you know, how much people live in urban environments as opposed to rural ones. But I think it's a useful starting point. So if anyone is going to have an account that takes seriously environmental impacts, my fourth consideration was they have to understand the empirics. So let's bear that in mind. And then I think when we do that, I think that Connolly's account looks objectionably monocausal. 
because it looks at the P and doesn't um, want to reduce the consumption or change the level of technology. Now, she does say things about consumption, but they're to the effect of people aren't going to reduce that. But I think the fact that people aren't going to do something doesn't bear on what rights they do or don't have. So it's also true that people uh, driving in a motorway are very unlikely to stick to the 70 mile an hour speed limit. But the fact that they don't comply with that doesn't mean they have a right to do that. Uh, so I think what she should really say is you have a right to a certain environmental impact. And it's not purely done in terms of uh, how many children you have, but your, the children, the level of consumption, and the degree to which you support clean technology. So uh, objection two, then, is on any account that just pulls one of the levers, why aren't you pu pulling the other two? Objection three is um, I want to dispute the account of reproductive um, rights because she has two strategies for denying that people have a right as a couple to more than one child. Strategy one is to say that rights protect um, you know, basic interests without which you could barely function. Um, or, you know, barely lead a worthwhile life. And she equates this with uh, Raz's view, Joseph Raz's interest theory of rights. And then she says, look, come on, you don't need two kids to have a fu uh, fulfilling a worthwhile life. One, one is enough. But the objection to this is that's just wrong about rights and it's wrong about Raz. I mean, Raz's view is that you have a right when you have an interest that is sufficient to impose duties on others. And so you can have rights to things, the denial of which wouldn't mean that you can't lead a fulfilling life. Like I have a, a right to uh, you know, wear purple socks or a yellow tie, but um, that's not central to my human flourishing. So I just think she's wrong about rights, many of the rights we have. Uh, I have a, you know, a right to, to uh, read Lady Chatterley's Lover, but deny me of it, I can still lead a, a perfectly good, rich and rewarding life. The other thing is, if you took this view, then she should really clamp down on consumption um, and, and waste as well, because you, know, you don't have a, a right to a plasma television on this account or um, high consumption lifestyles. So there's a peculiar asymmetry or you know, uh, distended focus. She acknowledged this at one point, and then she has a second strategy, which is to say, you know, whenever you have a right, there's a limit, and that limit is imposed by the harm principle. And having babies causes harm to others. But um, that's just uh, too quick, because it doesn't take seriously the IPAT formula. Uh, if a society has more babies, but has much reduced consumption, and invest in clean technology, then it just doesn't necessarily follow that they've caused harm. So the failure to engage with the empirics, I think, undermines the treatment of what you have a right to do. Um, just a fourth query is, uh, she says that couples have a right to one child. And normally I'm an egalitarian, but not when it's restricted goods you know, picked out on their own. So it seems, I think, an objectionable kind of egalitarianism. Because it says to a Bangladeshi, for example, or a Bangladeshi couple, you have a right to one child, just the same as a New York couple. Now, from an ecological point of view, that's crazy because uh, their environmental impact is uh, massively different. But also from a burden-sharing point of view, it seems uh, very unjust uh, because why should the burden be borne equally when some have created far more to the problem? So... Um, I don't think this is the route we should go down. Now, there's another common view out there with which I have more sympathy, but I think it's incomplete. And this one also takes population seriously. But it says if you realize people's uh, socioeconomic rights properly, then this will reduce population uh, growth and ultimately population size. And so again, it's talking about population, it's giving an account of reproductive justice, but it's claiming this will be sustainable. So there's a sort of a, a self-protecting mechanism. And the rights people emphasize here are rights to reproductive autonomy in terms of you know, access 
to um, affordable or free contraception, uh, rights to education, especially for women, um, so that uh, they can enter the economy, they can be more independent, or they will just defer uh, having children. And rights to an adequate standard of living, which would undercut incentives for people to have children as a sort of social security mechanism. Uh, I've misspelled sending, by the way, there's too many G's in there. Now, there's a, there's a wealth of empirical literature that really seems to back this up by people like John Bungartz um, at the Population, uh, I don't know what it's called now, Council in, in New York. Um, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the empirics, but when I read the studies, they look quite persuasive on the impacts, for example, this has had in countries like Bangladesh as opposed to countries like Pakistan. So, um, you know, and as someone who endorses liberal values, this seems much more appealing to me. But, you know, I begin to get a bit nervous about this account for various reasons. Um, so, uh, one is, it seems to put the focus on the developing world. But, you know, if our concern is with environmental sustainability, then, uh, you know, shouldn't our attention be as much, if not more, on the affluent world? of Europe and North America, where we have these very fossil fuel intensive lifestyles. So it seems odd to focus on Bangladeshis, for example, whose emissions are something like a tenth of those of a US citizen. Here's another oddity, uh, which is people often treat the existing population level as a baseline, such that if it goes up, it's bad, and if it goes down, um, it's, it's bad. But why assume that? So suppose population is going um, down in Portugal, which it is, or, uh, or Germany, or Italy, or Spain. Why should we treat the baseline as now? It's a bit like when people look at greenhouse gas emissions, and they look at the amount that people emit now, and then think any departure from that is somehow unwarranted. But, but we need an argument as to why we're taking the status quo there. Third question, is this really equitable burden sharing? Because it's saying, well, to deal with this problem, you know, we should look at the developing world and make sure there aren't too many people. Um, that seems to miss out a big part of the burden sharing requirement. Now, I think there are answers to these questions, or at least some of these questions. But I guess the thing that most troubles me is the fourth one, arbitrariness. Because um, like Connolly's one, it doesn't go through this procedure, I think anything must go through, which is tell us what's a just society that we're aiming for? Um, and will we, in fact, be living beyond our means? It's just, in a sense, crossing uh, our fingers and thinking, well, I really hope that if we realise these, it will, in fact, reduce um, the, the figures so that we're not living beyond our means. But there's no guarantee that it will, or there's no uh, assurance that it will. So if it, if it did, then I would be you know, quite happy and relieved. But um, it makes me wonder whether more needs to be done. So it's the arbitrariness thing that really uh, is troubling me there. So now I want to introduce a third perspective on population. And to some extent, you're going to think, why is he talking about this? Um, that's why I've said, and now for something completely different. But I'm going to put it in here because if you read some books on population and demographics, and if you look at some policy disputes on population and demographics, none of what I've said so far would feature. And what would feature um, is the following discussion. Uh, let's take Europe, for example. I, allude, I said it already. Countries like Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal have got um, very low replacement rates. Not only that, we have people living longer. We have an aging society. How are we going to cope, um, if we care about the welfare state, with looking after those older generations who are living on and on, so they're claiming pensions. Um, they're also claiming sort of medical health. Uh, and yet we don't have a cohort coming in who are working and providing services to the economy, which we can tax and then uh, look after the elderly. So this is a perspective on population, uh, and it's uh, live and active in, in policy debates. 
uh, but also academic ones. So someone based at ANU, Peter MacDonald, wrote, you know, we should have pro-natalist policies for this, for this reason. We have an EU um, Commission green paper. I can't remember the date, I'm afraid. But although it's quite sensible and sensitive on many issues, it does say we need to think of innovative measures to support the birth rate. Um, we have um, Matteo Renzi in Italy incentivizing um, the production of children by having baby bonuses. Uh, Do It for Denmark was an ad campaign that, um, that ran, I think, last year, encouraging Danes to have children. And, and there are communes in, um, in Denmark where people have been told, look, unless you lot have more um, children, we're closing down a lot of the hospitals and schools. So if you want those, then deliver. Uh, the former Prime Minister of Portugal, uh, I think, talked about demographic suicide. Now, I think you know, we can't ignore this problem. So uh, here's three points. Um, these people are, are right to point to the problems we face with low fertility and um, ageing societies. And they are actually talking about sustainability. It's just not environmental sustainability. They're talking about sustainability of the welfare state over time. And I think that, you know, that matters. Um, but secondly, it strikes me as utterly unacceptable to do this and um, ignore entirely the environmental impacts of those policies. Uh, and thirdly, um, it strikes me that we just have to find other ways of coping with these types of problems of an aging society. And, um, you know, to be fair, this is, I think, what many politicians are thinking. Uh, but, you know, it requires changing, let's say, in a country like Britain, an attitude towards migration and immigration. It means changing, as is happening already in West European countries, uh, views on pension uh, policy in retirement age. All of these innovative things I think we need to think about. The one thing I think we can't do is impose greater environmental burdens because... It's all very well caring about the sustainability of the welfare state, but if you do so in a way that undercuts the ability um, you know, of human life to function in a just society in other ways, then that's unacceptable. Okay, I think, can I just check, we have 10 minutes left? Or, um, so how, how do I think uh, we should address these questions? I've given you three um, kind of views on population. The restrictive one, the liberal one, and then one that has to do with population, but it's just changing the subject, but I think it's got a, it's driven by a valid concern. So uh, I'm not gonna tell you how many children you can or cannot have. Uh, I haven't got a grasp of the empirics. What I want to do is give you a normative framework that I think we need to address this question. So remember, the question is, you know, how much can we use in natural resources? Um, Okay, well, desideratum number one is we need a, an account of intergenerational justice. We need to know what we owe future generations. Uh, I haven't come to a final view on what the right answer to that is, but I do think that some of the commonly expressed ones are implausible. So take the Brundtland one that says that we should leave future societies so that people can meet their basic needs. You know, even if you have a capacious understanding of what basic needs are, that strikes me as objectionably penalising people who come later, just because they come later. It means we could party and have you know, massively uh, happier lives and more fulfilling lives, as long as they're above this sufficiency threshold. And why? Because they come a bit later in time than earlier in time. Yeah, if someone had an egalitarian kind of one, then that's vulnerable to an intertemporal leveling down objection. So if you say, look, you know, everyone should stay at this level now, and future people shouldn't be worse off because they come later in time, but they can't be better off as well, then we would lock all future human beings uh, at this level now, and that also seems objectionable. So I think the most promising starting point is one articulated by Brian Barry, which said uh, that we should leave future generations with at least as good uh, a quality of life as we think we're entitled to now. Um, it can be better than, but it must not be uh, any worse than. 
Now, there's all kinds of points you could make about the formulation he gives there. Um, because when he talks about leaving it no worse than uh, when they found it, it matters a lot on who you're talking about. Are you talking about someone like me or someone living in Bihar, North India? So I want to say we should think about what um, we think we're entitled to and then we should ensure that future generations are either entitled to or get as much or you know, more if we can do so at reasonable sacrifice. So let's not go for these minimal brunt and tight ones. Let's go for something that, um, that treats them in a way that I think they could reasonably accept. Okay, secondly, the metric of justice. You know, I'm just going to assert, it seems to me that the thing that really matters here is, is well-being. It's not resources, it's not GDP, it's not natural resources per se, it's leaving a flourishing life and having the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, I can't fully defend that now, I can't even partially defend that now, but uh, I'll just register agreement with those like Amartya Sen who, who say that anything else tends to fetishize let's say, resources or primary goods. You know, I don't care about resources per se. I care about resources because they enable me to do things that, that I think I have reason to value. Now, if this is right, then um, we need to then consider the, the views of people like John Stuart Mill and John Maynard Keynes, who have a, a similar account of, of well-being to the one I want to affirm. But they also raise the question about whether you know, the way we do justice to future generations is by pursuing economic growth. And so Mill, writing in um, the mid-19th century, thought we were going to reach a stage where economic growth would come to an end and we'd have a stationary state. And others um, before him, like David Ricardo, had had, I think, a similar conclusion, but Ricardo thought this was terrible. Whereas Mill's view is, no, this is fine, right? As, as long as you get to a certain material standard of living, then you can actually pursue what really matters and what he calls the art of living as opposed to the art of getting on. And you find the same in, in Keynes's The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren, where he says that once we reach a certain material standard of living, then we should focus on um, the art of life rather than the means of life. I've given you kind of next to no reason for you to agree with me on this. I'm just kind of plonking this out there. This is what I think a just society now and in the future involves protecting access to. Um, okay, well then, what's the third element? I've given you the metric and the principle. The third element is, well, here I'm going to side with people like Amartya Sen and say, you know, we should endorse all those rights that he was prescribing. And I think for the reasons that people like Bongartz and others give, they're likely to have those effects on demographic change. But, um, but we have a sustainability constraint. And so what we can't do now is exercise choice in ways which undermine the possibility for future people to enjoy the kind of society I sketched. So this means there are very you know, real limits on how much we can consume natural resources, uh, partly because they don't necessarily contribute to our well-being that much but partly because they may undercut the possibility of future people leading those fulfilling lives. But the thing I want to sort of add is, so I think people like Sen are wrong not to think that there might be any limits on human activity imposed by future generations. I think there are. But I think where people like Conley go wrong is to say that the way you must discharge that duty to future generations is by pulling the population lever. So I think the corollary of the IPAT formula is you should live within your environmental um, limits. But uh, you can do so, you can discharge that duty in different ways. So um, you can have fewer children, um, but then you can consume more natural resources. You can invest in more clean technology um, and maybe consume more. So you can pull all the three levers as long as the net effect is that you're not living outside that perimeter of the sustainability constraint. So um, I think the advantage this has over people like Sen is it doesn't say, well, fingers crossed, if we honor these liberal rights, everything will turn out fine. But the advantage I think it has over people like Conley is that it's not monocausal. It's not just saying, you know, focus just on the P. Uh, it gives you choice. Now, just to wrap up, people may say, well, what does this really mean? You're saying 
uh, people can reduce consumption? Well, they can eat sustainably. For example, they can eliminate meat and they can uh, choose vegetables which have a lower environmental impact than others. Um, they can grow crops in different ways and not overuse nitrogen in fertilizer. Um, they can just travel less, they can drive less, they can drive slower, they can expect things more slowly. Um, they can turn the thermostat down in their house. In the, in the UK, house temperatures have gone up by something like 7 degrees in the last 30 years. So the more efficient our energy systems have got, the more we just turn up the temperature. Um, the last one is slightly tongue-in-cheek, but there were findings that people's you know, environmental impact goes up if they live apart and that they live together. So I'm not saying if you really hate someone, stick with them, but it's true that divorce has environmental impacts. But the way people live together um, has environmental impacts. Um, the waste we inflict on the world has environmental impacts. The way we design towns and cities where we have this urban sprawl. Um, so I'm, what I'm trying to do here is just convert the rather abstract saying about reducing consumption to what does that uh, mean? Um, and then, of course, there's tea, there's technology. So we can enhance energy efficiency. We can share it. We can incentivize um, the creation of other clean technologies. OK, so just to sum up then, I think if we did this, this would be a sustainable kind of approach, and it would be a liberal approach. It would meet all the four criteria, right? Because it's guided by a vision of what we owe future generations. And then it works back from that to what we're entitled to, to do now. So it's kind of targeted to achieve sustainability. Um, whilst it imposes responsibilities, it, it does so in a way that respects choice. Um, and I think this choice is valuable because you know, it's intrinsically significant. Uh, there's no need to go just down one route. Uh, and uh, it makes realizing it more politically feasible. So, Population matters. It matters enormously. It's not the only thing that matters. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Um, this is just a, a summary. Thank you very much. <laughs>